Well, hey guys, hello from Terminal 2 of Heathrow. I have a little bit of time before I fly back to Cologne from my conference in the UK. And given that, I thought it would be a good time to start the series An Atheist Defends the Historical Jesus. That's the working title. We'll see what the final version is. But in this video, it's going to be an introductory video and it's going to set up the other five videos in this series. First invented in the 1800s, the idea that Jesus never existed has been revived by contemporaneous authors and promoted in popular books and on YouTube. In response to this range of books, Professor Bart Ehrman wrote the book, Did Jesus Exist? In this series, I will draw on that book, but I will present my take on the issue and why I think that there is a better way to frame this question. I want to approach this as a social scientist. In the social sciences, there are a lot of competing models to explain social phenomenon because people are complicated and things change over time, so we're always having to re-evaluate our theories. We choose between the best theories by putting our various explanations or models into competition, and we evaluate them on maybe the amount of variance they explain or the strength of the variables after controlling for other theoretical variables in the model. I want to take that approach, starting out with the competing ideas as theories and look to see whether or not the theories explain the evidence. For reasons that I'm going to explain, I can't do a mythicist theory because there isn't just one mythicist theory. There is, however, one historical Jesus theory. That's the one I find more convincing based upon my evaluations. And so I'm going to go through each of the pieces of evidence and show how the historical Jesus theory can be used to account for what we observe. And then for people who have a mythicist point of view or one of the many mythicist point of view, they can take the points that I'm going to raise in this series and I'll be providing my PowerPoint slides openly on uh, in a public link so everyone can look at them and they can then take up those ideas and try to present their case for their ideas. The videos in the series will proceed as follows. This is the first video, the background information, what makes a good theory, we're going to look at historical methods and how historians use them. We're going to then look at the historical settings of the first century to understand the context of the time period we're looking at. We're going to also review the historical Jesus theory and the mythical Jesus theories. In video two, we're going to be examining the evidence of early Christian critics, evidence from Aramaic origins, evidence from the idea of a crucified Messiah, the idea of Jesus of Nazareth, and also examining evidence about John the Baptist. In video three, I will be presenting evidence from examining the Gospels, evidence from later sources outside the New Testament. Then we'll be looking at canonical sources outside the Gospel and Paul, and non-Pauline epistles. In video four, I'll be presenting evidence on Paul's timeline and how it maps onto the theory, Paul's writings about Jesus. We're going to be looking at the text mentioning James, the brother of Jesus, and we're also going to be evaluating changing Christologies in the first three centuries of the Common Era. Finally, in video five, we'll be reviewing the history of mythicism. We will review again the varied and contradictory mythical Jesus accounts. And then in the last video, I want to present my challenges to the mythical Jesus defenders and wrap the series up in a conclusion. In terms of the background to this series, the current dispute goes like this. Throughout Christian history and since the start of critical theory analysis of the biblical and non-canonical texts, experts held the view that Jesus was an historical man in time. In recent centuries, mythicists have proposed a range of contradictory accounts as to how and why a mythical Jesus was invented. From what I've observed, looking at the debates, the debate around Jesus as an historical figure really ends up focusing on the evidence that exists. And in general, what I've seen is mythicists attacking the reliability of all the extant writings we have, then often avoiding any burden of proof in terms of substantiating their own assertions about the texts, while the historical Jesus defenders explain why the texts and the evidence in writing should be considered reliable. To my mind, this is the wrong debate to be having. Therefore, I want to reframe it and improve what I think make an improvement to the quality of discussions we're having on this topic.
As a social scientist, when we go out and collect data, when we have our observations, our data is our data. Our observations are our observations. And it is up to the theory to bear the weight of accounting for what we observe. Therefore, we always kind of start from observation and we go back to observation. And a theory performs relative to how well it can account for what we can observe. Does this mean we need to uncritically accept every piece of evidence at face value? No, of course not. We have to evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of the evidence as part of our theoretical exploration and evaluation. What I plan on doing is to present the existing evidence well, part of it at least. I've got 14 points that I want to make, but there is far more I could make. I thought 14 was a reasonable number for this series. And I'm going to use it and show how we can frame his the historical Jesus idea as a theory and how that theory can account for every single observation we have. To repeat, I'm going to show that in every single observation in the series, not a single piece of evidence cannot be accounted for using the idea of Jesus as an historical figure. Now, mythicists are free to take up any of the contradictory accounts presented by various mythicists over the last few centuries and attempt to do a response video. That's fine. As I said, I'm going to make these slides available for use for other people. And I'm going to do it in two ways. I'm going to make the entire video series slides available because that's what some people have asked for. And then I'm also going to break it down segment by segment. So this one will have an attachment to the full series documentation. It will have a separate segment that will only cover what I cover in this first video series. What makes a good theory? Well, one element of it is parsimony. The ability to explain in relatively few terms and statements the phenomenon that needs to be explained. Another way to evaluate the strength of a theory is the breadth of the phenomenon that it explains. So if a theory can account for all of the observations, and another theory can only account for 10% or 20% or 40% of the observations, clearly a theory that can account for everything we observe is superior to one that cannot. Another test of a theory is whether or not it can accurately predict new phenomena. In this case, as archaeologists have moved through time, we've discovered new non-canonical gospels, other fragments of writing, and the question is, you know, which of the two theories best account the, for the evidence that we find in these new texts that don't currently, that weren't previously part of what was known to exist in terms of the biblical writings. And a theory that can, again, be mapped onto new discoveries and still fit is a preferable theory to one that can't. Another important element of a theory that distinguishes it, in my mind in particular, from pseudoscience is the idea that it can have a, you can answer the question, how would I know if I were wrong? So a theory is the way that we think the world works in a certain way, but if you can't answer the question, how would I know if I were wrong, then your theory isn't as strong because you can keep making up excuses or explanations ad hoc that repair the theory or fill the gap. An example of this might be Freudian analysis. Right? We can think about concepts like the id, the ego, and the superego, but we can't really falsify something being driven by the id compared to something being driven by the ego. Whereas when we look at something, a different phenomenon like American presidential outcomes, we know that people's economic evaluations often play a very large role in um, you can predict pretty well how a person is going to vote based on their economic evaluations. So if I had a theory that said when someone has a positive evaluation of the economy, uh, they're more likely to vote for the incumbent party, and then they, the election goes the other way, and despite people having positive economic evaluations, you see the challenger going forward, well, that's how you would know the theory was not helpful. It was incorrect. You can then refute that theory and say, we have to find a, a different explanation for this phenomenon because economic evaluations aren't doing it. Before I present the historical Jesus uh, as a theory slide, I want to compare it by presenting the mythical Jesus side. And to do that, I'm first going to start by going over the history of mythicism. In 1791, Constantin Francois Volney wrote Ruins of Empire, in which he argued that all religions are at the heart the same, and all religions are a variation of sun god worship. He thought that the early Christians invented a savior 
they called, it was Jesus. And he also thought that Christ came from the god Krishna and was an adaptation of that as a sun god. And we know, of course, that actually Christ is a Greek word. It doesn't come from Krishna. So we have somebody who's not an expert, who has an idea of just all religions coming fundamentally out of sun god worship. And using that conclusion, he fits the idea of Jesus into that narrative. This idea that all religions were at heart a sun god worship or some expression of a unified religious outlook was quite popular in the 1800s because we see in 1795 that Charles Francois Dupuis wrote The Origins of All Religion. He wanted to, as he said, uncover the nature of the original deity that lies behind all religions. The next time we have writings about someone who thought that Jesus was a completely mythical or non-existent person was from Bruno Bauer, who was actually a German scholar in the area of like New Testament writings. And he thought Jesus was a literary invention of the gospel writers and they had amalgamated Judaism with Stoicism. Moving forward in time, we get to the 1900s where J.M. Robertson wrote Christianity and Mythology. And in his book, he tried to create links between fertility gods and Jesus being raised from the dead. So you can see initially the idea here was that all religions came from one core deity and all of them were expressions uh, of a unique cultural version of that original deity. That idea became passe and the new line of movement went into this idea of you know, for fertility gods and Jesus. And also written in 1909, Andrew Drews's The Christ Myth was the book that convinced Lenin that Jesus was not a real historical person. In Did Jesus Exist, Professor Ehrman reviews the history of mythicism as I've reviewed it and also over the course of the book he brings in different authors and presents their take on what a mythical Jesus meant. And I, want, I went through the book and collected all the various um, accounts that I could find and I've just put them into two slides that shows the variety and the contradictions within the claims of mythicists. First we had Volney and Dupuis who argued that Christianity was an amalgamation of ancient mythologies and they said that Jesus was a mythical character. Strauss thought that Jesus existed but that the New Testament's miracle stories were mythical supernatural retellings of mundane events. According to Bauer, Christianity was a synthesis of Stoicism and Philo. Jesus was a literary invention of the Gospel authors, not a historical person. Graves thinks that Jesus did not exist, but instead was based on crucified or ascending demigods from different countries. Remsburg thinks that there was a historical Jesus who existed, but the Christ of Christianity was mythological. Druze thinks that Christianity is the result of a Jewish Gnostic cult that appropriated aspects of Greek philosophy, whereas Allegro thinks that Christianity began as a shamanistic cult. Wells thinks that Paul's mythical Jesus and a minimally historical Jesus were fused together, while Doherty's view of the mythical Jesus can be summed up as follows. No historical Jesus worthy of the name existed. Christianity began with a belief in a spiritual mythical figure. The Gospels are essentially allegory and fiction, and no single identifiable person lay at the root of the Galilean preaching tradition. While Harper thinks that the Gospels were reworked ancient pagan myths, Thompson thinks that Christianity was invented by Christians who wanted to create a savior figure out of stories found in the Jewish scriptures, and Carrier thinks that early Christians considered Jesus a celestial being known only by revelations. As you can see, it's hard for me to present a historical Jesus, mythical Jesus counterpoint because I've got 12 here on this list. There might be more that Aramin missed. And so I can't possibly present um, a competing version of historical Jesus theory to mythical Jesus theory because there isn't a single mythical Jesus theory. And that is why I'm kind of kicking it back to people who want to promote the idea of a mythical Jesus to pick one of these or make up their own and then present their evidence um, to explain why their theory best fits what we observe in terms of the extant writings available to us today. As a social scientist, one of the problems that I have with the mythical Jesus approach or theory, if we want to call it that, is that it's not one theory. There are many different versions of the mythical Jesus theory and everyone who looks into it seems to invent their own.
That's not a strength of the theory, that's a weakness. Now in contrast to the mythical Jesus competing in varied uh, and contradictory accounts, we have only one historical Jesus theory, and that goes like this. Around the mid to late 20s of the first century of the Common Era, there was a Jewish, Aramaic-speaking man named Jesus from Nazareth in the Galilee. He was a follower of John the Baptist, and then he began preaching an apocalyptic message, the kingdom of God, to Jews in the area. This Jesus gathered several followers, eventually making his way to Jerusalem. His preaching was brought to the attention of the Roman authorities by local Jewish leaders, and the Romans executed this Jesus for sedition, referencing, you know, in the Gospels, they all mention him being the king of the Jews. After his death, his followers believed they had seen Jesus. They then preached his resurrection and his apocalyptic message in Jerusalem and across the Middle East. This has been the long-standing view throughout history. And when you compare the multiple, varied, and contradictory mythical Jesus accounts, the historical Jesus theory wins the competition on evaluating theory by parsimony, the ability to explain in relatively few terms and statements. The decision in this case definitely has to go to the historical Jesus theory as being a stronger theory on the measure of parsimony. In addition to looking at these theories, I also want to mention a few of the historical criteria for establishing authentic tradition because they will be relevant when we're evaluating different pieces of evidence in the series. One way to evaluate a piece of evidence is to look for contextual credibility. Stories that do not match what we know from history or from archaeology cannot be called historically accurate. For instance, in the Gospel of John, the writer puts into the mouth of Jesus comments about being thrown out of the synagogues that don't appear anywhere in the Gospels. We know that the Christians and the Jews around the 90s of the first century of the Common Era were on, starting to split off because of the issue of the divinity of Jesus and other divisions. And so the author of John puts into the mouth of Jesus discussions about being thrown out of the synagogues because that was what was going on in his community. But we can't see that statement as historically accurate because there's no other substantiation for that idea and it doesn't fit what we know about what was happening in the early 30s and the other writings that we have from an earlier time, from earlier time periods. Another way to evaluate evidence is to look for multiple attestation. A tradition that appears in multiple independent sources has a greater likelihood of being historically reliable than a tradition that only appears in one. Going back to this example of John, when Jesus talks about being thrown out of the synagogues, that appears in John's Gospel and that's a first appearance. And that is not corroborated by other independent accounts. This again raises flags that it's probably not uh, historically accurate. It doesn't go back to an historical figure. We're also going to be looking at the criterion of dissimilarity, a slightly awkward phrase, but a very basic idea. The criterion of dissimilarity tries to take the bias of a source into account. And stories that run counter to the Christian author's interests are less likely to have been made up. We're going to be looking a little bit later at the idea that Jesus of Nazareth does not help the gospel writers make the case that Jesus was the Messiah. It would have been a lot better in the story if Jesus had been from Bethlehem, because that was the city that had been associated with, this, with David and the Messiah, the Anointed One. So the fact that Jesus is of Nazareth and not of Bethlehem, which would have advantaged the writers in terms of promoting him as the Messiah, means that the most likely explanation is that the historical Jesus really did come from Nazareth. It was such a well-known fact, they couldn't get over it. And that shows, uh, because of this dissimilarity from the interest of the authors, that it is more likely to be true. Now, none of these criterion make any kind of certainty claims of what truth is, but we, the way to use them in the best possible way is to evaluate those traditions that more probably can be accepted as reliable. Before ending this first part of the series, I want to just put some context out in terms of the historical setting in which historians see the, a historical Jesus operating. What were the thoughts and ideas, the values, the cultural norms happening at that time? And we're going to look at this by examining the writings of Josephus, who was a contemporary who lived in the first century of the Common Era.
In first century Palestine, almost all Jews were monotheists, and they followed the law, or the Torah, the five books of Moses. There was variation on how they were monotheistic, but they were overwhelmingly monotheistic according to contemporary accounts written by Josephus. We're going to look at the four classes of uh, Jewish belief according to him. The first group that you're probably most familiar with is the Pharisees. The Pharisees stressed the importance of the law and developed a number of interpretations as how to how to best keep it. That was what they called the oral law. In the Gospels, Jesus often butts head with the Pharisees over how to interpret the law, but not whether it should be kept. A second group that historians know less about, called the Sadducees, were closely connected with the temple cults in Jerusalem. They were wealthy, aristocratic, and the high priest came from within this group. They worked in collaboration with the Roman occupiers, and they were also the people who made up the Sanhedrin. They placed no stock in the oral law. Their focus was on the temple, and they appear to have been the ones who had Jesus arrested and turned over to trial by um, Pilate, the Roman governor. The third group, called the Essenes, are people that we know more about now because of the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Essenes were in conflict with both the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They believed that all other Jews were corrupt, that they had misunderstood the law, they had defiled the temple, and they believed they were living in end times, as they would write at the end of the age. And they believed that God would send two messengers to deliver his people from the evil forces, God would triumph over the Romans, and the kingdom of God would then come to earth. The final group that our source Josephus gives us is just named the fourth philosophy. These were Jews who thought the Romans had wrongfully taken possession of their promised lands. Members of the fourth philosophy thought that God wanted them to take up the sword to oppose the Romans and foment political and military revolts. They opposed the Sadducees, who, were, who they saw as collaborators with the Romans, and their focus was on the land, getting it back, because they believed it had been promised to Israel by God. Another element of first century Palestine that is important to understand is the notion of Jewish apocalypticism. For centuries, Jewish prophets had declared that God was punishing the Jews for turning away from him. For reference, you can look at Hosea, Amos, Isaiah, and Jeremiah. By the first century in Palestine, Jewish apocalypticism changed that into the idea that suffering was not a punishment from God. Instead, the evil forces in the world were punishing the righteous, and for that you can look at Daniel, written about 165 before the Common Era. Jewish apocalypticists believed that God had revealed to them the secrets to make sense of reality, that God had temporarily ceded control of the world to these powerful cosmic forces that opposed him. And this was why, was why God's people were suffering. But God would soon reassert his authority, destroying the forces of evil, restoring them to their place of privilege, and bringing in a utopian kingdom that would last forever. There's a reason why that theology sounds a lot like the Left Behind series, and that's because these ideas were picked up by Jesus and preached to his followers and became part of Christianity. And they are, in that Christian form, still with us today. We haven't really started looking too much at the evidence yet, but this theology of Jewish apocalypticism fits the theology of Jesus as presented in the Christian writings, and that includes Paul's own apocalyptic beliefs. Other elements of Jewish apocalypticism that you will see if you read the Gospels and how they present Jesus are notions of dualism. Apocalypticists were dualists. They believed in two fundamental components of reality, the forces for good and the forces for evil. Of course, good was their god and evil was God's personal enemy, the devil, Satan. This idea of a personal devil is an idea that's not found in Jewish scriptures. For instance, look at, at how Satan and God interact in Job. But Jewish apocalypticists thought he existed. In this worldview, just as God had his angels, Satan had his demons. There was a cosmic battle that was going on all around them, and evil was winning, and that was why the world sucked. They believed that this present age was controlled by the devil, but that in a future age, everyone that opposed God would be destroyed and a good kingdom would, be, would appear. Again, does this sound like the Left Behind series or what?
people who entered that new age would be rewarded with an eternal feeling of peace and joy and bliss uh, to love and serve God, live in harmony in a world of rich abundance forever. Another feature of Jewish apocalypticism, as we can see, is that it was quite pessimistic. The future, of course, when God changes everything, is going to be awesome, but right now, it sucks. They also thought that things would get worse before they would get better. There were going to be more wars, more famine, more pestilence, more hunger and oppression. And then God would assert himself and make everything right. In this world, there would be ultimate vindication. God would conquer evil, not human beings. God would intervene in human history to overthrow evil and bring in his good kingdom. God would send a savior to right the wrongs of this world. You can see that in the book of Daniel, he calls him the son of man. God would destroy the anti-God forces. You can read for that the rich and powerful, the Roman oppressors. And the weak, the poor, the oppressed, and the righteous would be vindicated when God reasserted himself to establish a good kingdom on earth. When the Son of Man appeared, there would be a resurrection of the dead. The living and the dead would be judged at this time. And it is in this time period, or around the first century of the Common Era, that Jews began to affirm a doctrine of a future resurrection associated with the end of the age. The last element that Ehrman points to in his book was the notion of imminence. Jewish apocalypticists, like all apocalypticists, believed the kingdom was going to arrive very soon. They thought that things were getting as bad as they could possibly get, and that pretty soon God was going to intervene in human history and set things right. And again, we still see that belief being held by Christians today. Why is understanding all of this important? Understanding the competing Jewish sects, their views, the belief of Jewish apocalypticists at that time are all important when evaluating the competing theories of a historical Jesus or a mythical Jesus. Remember, the elements of a good theory are parsimony, breadth, accuracy of predictions of new phenomenon, or in this case, accounting for new evidence as it appears through archaeology, and its ability to be disproven. These explanations must fit within their cultural and historical context. And if we look at the apocalyptic message attributed to John the Baptist and Jesus and Paul, as well as many of the anonymous writers of the Gospels and other texts associated with the Jesus movement in the first century and second century CE, we see that their narratives fit within the apocalyptic viewpoints and the historical facts that I've laid out above. In the next few episodes, I will be presenting a piece of evidence and then showing how it can be accounted for by using the theory that Jesus was an historical person. I will draw on different material from across Did Jesus Exist, sometimes using information on different pages or even in different chapters and resynthesizing them into a broader category. In the last episode of the series, I'll review again the development of the mythical Jesus account and the competing theories. Finally, I'll summarize all the problematic pieces of evidence I've presented over the course of the series and present challenges to the mythical Jesus uh, proponents to answer in any response video to my series. Well, thanks for spending time with me at Heathrow. I've got about 45 minutes till my plane boards and I still have to get to my gate. So I want to thank you for making the time go a little bit faster and your patience in the less than ideal background circumstances that I find myself in. Until the next episode or the next time I put out a video. I've been Christy. You've been awesome. Thank you for watching all the way to the end of the video and I will see you soon. Bye.